Hello everyone and welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series, a series of short talks on life in the universe and related topics that I thought might be of interest. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something that's very topical, which is do viruses have rights? Now, about a couple of days ago, I saw a news story where a couple of people um, had uh, deliberately, apparently, gone out and caught coronavirus with the intention of protecting this virus. Uh, the argument was the World Health Organization was trying to destroy the coronavirus and uh, the virus has a right to live. So they would deliberately go out and uh, catch it in order to perpetuate it and protect it. Now, the news story didn't seem to do the rounds very much. I didn't see anything more of it. I suspect most people thought they were completely crazy. Um, but the point they raised, and I'm not necessarily uh, advocating their particular view. After all, I don't think that uh, coronavirus really needs much protection right now. There's plenty of it around. But the view they raised is actually not a new one. Uh, in the 1970s, the World Health Organization engaged in another battle with a virus that was much more destructive, the smallpox virus, that over the history of humanity has probably killed hundreds of millions of human beings. And in 1977, after a frankly heroic global effort, they cornered uh, smallpox, at least in the natural environment, in a Somali cook. And after um, vaccinating um, this individual, the smallpox virus was declared banished from the world. Of course, not completely. The virus still existed in stocks in the Center for Disease Control uh, in the US and in Vector, which was the, uh, is the Russian equivalent of the Center for Disease Control. Having said that, uh, the virus was brought to the edge of extinction. Um, and in 1976, just before this, uh, this heroic effort was finally accomplished, Bernard Dixon, who was a popular science writer, wrote a very intriguing um, article in New Scientist entitled uh, Smallpox, Imminent Extinction and an Unresolved Dilemma. And I personally think it's a sort of famous paper that is never really, it's not really a paper, it's more of a short opinion piece, but it should be more famous than it was because he was raising the very question that I think these two individuals the other day were raising, which is, um, do uh, microbes, do viruses have rights? Now, of course, the first technical problem is whether we even think viruses are alive uh, in any meaningful sense of the word. And if you're interested in that question, you can watch uh, talk number one in this series where I talk about whether viruses are alive. But that technical quibble aside, if we assume that viruses are part of the realm of living things, it does raise a question as to whether we have a right to make these things extinct. If I was to tell you that I'm going to go out and kill uh, every polar bear in the Arctic or get poachers to go out and kill every polar bear in the Arctic because, hey, you know, they don't do much use. They're not very useful to anyone. Why don't we just kill them all off and make them extinct? And then they won't stop, stop, uh, continue harassing people in Canadian high Arctic communities. I think you would be appalled. In fact, if I suggested the deliberate extinction of any creature on the earth uh, because it was causing human beings some trouble, uh, such as lions or species of whales, you would also regard that as quite appalling. So why then do viruses um, come into the, the boundaries of, of, of creatures that we think uh, should be destroyed or made extinct? Uh, forgetting the fact that viruses may not be alive, you could apply the same argument to the Black Death bacterium. If I suggested that we might make the Black Death bacterium extinct, I'm sure many people would agree uh, or think that that was a very good idea. Uh, and yet there is a living creature um, that is living on the earth, just like tigers and elephants, and might be has a right to continue its existence. What right do we have to make it extinct? Now, I think the intuitive sense that a virus like coronavirus or smallpox, as the case might be, should be driven to extinction is based on our idea that um, it causes great devastation to human society. And maybe it's the scale of that devastation uh, that gives us the sense that maybe it wouldn't be such a bad thing if these things were made extinct. But it still doesn't change the fact that engaging in the deliberate extinction of any creature uh, puts us on ethical territory that is extremely interesting and extremely problematic. Because if we really do think that living things have a right to exist and continue their existence, 
uh, then what is the difference between a smallpox virus or a black death bacterium and a tiger or an elephant? Uh, they've all evolved, they're all here on the earth, they're all doing their thing. And the fact is that only a very small minority of microbes uh, do devastation to humanity. Uh, so why should we uh, obliterate some of these or consign some of these organisms to total extinction? Um, one of the ways in which we can think about the ethics of, of bacteria and viruses is to think about, uh, first of all, their uses to humanity. I don't think any of us would be in any doubt that microbes are useful to human beings. We use them to brew beer, we use them to, uh, to make wine, to pickle our vegetables, to make cheese, uh, and even to make drugs. And so microbes have what ethicists would call instrumental value. They have practical value for humanity. So no one is any, in any doubt that we should preserve microbes for their instrumental uses, just as we might preserve a rainforest because it produces us some uh, useful products. There are all sorts of reasons for preserving and conserving uh, all sorts of different creatures because of their instrumental, their practical uses to humanity. The ethical difficulties come about when we think about the intrinsic value, as it's sometimes called, and whether we even think that intrinsic value exists. And this is the idea that things have a value beyond their mere use. If you think, for example, about a pet dog, or in a more extreme case, a child, uh, a pet dog or even a small child has uses to us in some way. And I think most of us would agree that these creatures have more than just uh, practical use. Your dog is not just useful for you because it gives you the opportunity to go out and get exercise. I think most of us would think that dogs have some sort of intrinsic value. They should be valued for their own right, independent of whether they're useful to someone. If your dog is no use to you any longer, you don't go and um, extinguish it because it has no use for you. You think that it has a life worth living, uh, that you have some moral duty to protect. This is the concept in some ways of uh, intrinsic value, or at least part of the concept of intrinsic value. And this is where the microbes come in. Um, microbes have practical uses, but do they have intrinsic value? Do they have a right to carry on as they are um, left alone to continue their own trajectory? We should note that many bacteria uh, do not do harm. Most bacteria do not do harm to humanity. And there are some bacteria that have been protected. If you go to the western shoreline of Australia, you'll come to Shark's Bay, Shark Bay, that contains within it um, stromatolites. These are giant mounds of microbes, about a metre across, made up of cyanobacteria that we think may have been some of the most primitive photosynthetic um, microbes on the earth, or at least microbes that were capable of producing oxygen for photosynthesis. And these stromatolites are extremely rare. Um, they are extremely um, uh, uh, impressive structures and rather wonderful structures. They're made of microbes, but you can see them with your own eye. And the stromatolites are part of a World Heritage Site. So in that case, um, the microbes are actually being preserved as part of this heritage site. They have actually gained protection. So compare that to our smallpox virus that was hounded down by the World Health Organization uh, to the brink of obliteration and our microbes in Shark Bay living in those stromatolites. So we can see this great complexity here. Some microbes do us no harm. Some are very beautiful and form giant mounds, and we think they're worthy of our protection. Some of them cause such devastation that they deserve to go extinct. But I think it's a very fascinating uh, area of debate, the question of microbial ethics, in particular because microbes uh, have such great numbers that it's very difficult to protect them. It's relatively easy to protect elephants. You can just avoid poaching them, and uh, if they come onto your land, you can try and encourage them to move off your field. But you don't have to uh, shoot them or obliterate them. Microbes are impossible not to kill. Every time you take a shower, you kill microbes. Every time you bleach your house, you kill microbes. And in fact, in 1977, uh, there was a very intriguing and I think very fun paper that was written by, uh, by Joe uh, Patrouche, which was called Legal Rights for Germs. And in that article that was published in Analog uh, Science, Fact and Fiction, he described a world where microbial rights have been recognized. And in some ways, 
his paper was uh, a reductio ad absurdum, a, a, a way of trying to show how ridiculous it would be for microbes to have rights. And he describes a world where it becomes illegal to clean your house and it's illegal to use um, deodorants. Anything that kills microbes is made illegal because germs have legal rights. And it's a reflection of what really would happen and how ridiculous the world would become if we actually recognized microbial rights. But it's an intriguing um, uh, essay because what it does do is bring into sharp focus the difficulty of trying to decide whether microbes have any claim to ethical value and therefore any claim to rights. Do we have any responsibilities towards microbes? Of course, our inability to uh, live our lives without killing microbes does not necessarily mean there are no instances in which we can protect microbes. If you think about the um, stromatolites in Sharks Bay, uh, we can protect those. So perhaps uh, a proper ethics for microbes is to recognize that where there are um, microbial communities that we can leave alone, uh, for example, microbes living in lakes or stromatolites living uh, in the beaches of Western Australia, as the case may be, we should do our best to preserve them, uh, partly because these microbes are a necessary part of the environment uh, and are a vital part of our planetary health. In fact, microbes play enormous roles, biogeochemical cycles, as they're called, enormous roles in cycling elements on the Earth from carbon, sulfur, iron, and all the other elements that churn through the crust of the Earth pass uh, ultimately um, through microbes in most cases. So microbes form an essential part of the base of the food chain and the health of the, of the biosphere. So perhaps we should protect them where we can, but if they cause huge devastation to humanity, uh, perhaps we might think that it is uh, worthwhile to try and hold down their numbers even to the point of extinction, such as smallpox and such as the national lockdown that I'm experiencing and we're all experiencing here in the UK uh, because of the spread of coronavirus. We have no compunction or guilt about trying to stop the spread of coronavirus in some sense killing off the coronavirus, trying to stop it from perpetuating itself. I don't think any of us are sitting in our homes thinking, oh, the, the poor old coronavirus, uh, why are we trying to stop its spread? Um, that's just like trying to kill off colonies of, of uh, or groups of elephants, or it's like trying to uh, kill off rainforests. Why are we doing this? We should be letting the coronavirus express its full creative capacities and take over our society. I, I'm sure that apart from the two individuals who appeared on the news recently, most of us do not think that. And we think that because the scale of the destruction that this microbe can, can achieve with our civilization is such that we're willing to believe that our own um, instrumental uh, interests, our own practical interests, overwhelm any uh, intrinsic value that we might think individual bacteria have or viruses, as the case may be, if you think that they're alive. So what is the answer to our question, do viruses have rights? I think almost certainly not. Um, but do microbes um, fall into a realm of creatures where we should just completely ignore them and destroy them whenever we think we want to? Um, I think that's going to the other extreme. I think there are microbes we can protect and we should try and protect them um, if and where we can. In the case of coronavirus, I don't think we should be worried about trying to kill it off. I don't think it's necessary for anyone to go out there and infect themselves to protect the coronavirus. But I do still think there's an ethical quandary, as Bernard Dixon so presently raised in 1976, about that final act of extinction. There is something buried in our minds that gives us uh, a discomfort with the idea of finally driving even the worst uh, microbe or virus on the earth to its ultimate extinction. Ultimately, that ethical question uh, may not be solvable, and we may not even want to drive viruses and bacteria to complete extinction anyway, because keeping stops of those uh, creatures might help us to do research and understand how we can make better vaccines. So from a practical point of view, driving a virus to total extinction may not be a good idea anyway. It may always be good to keep back uh, some samples of that virus just in case it re-emerges like smallpox and we want to be able to study it. Um, so it may not be uh, a relevant question for us anyway. But do viruses have rights? I don't think so. Should we protect some microbes? Almost certainly yes. Should we drive viruses to complete extinction? Well, I think that's an ethical question that is extraordinarily fascinating 
but from a practical point of view, maybe we don't want to make them extinct anyway. So those are just my views. Uh, you may have your own views, and while you're sitting at home uh, confined in your house, maybe you might like to have a discussion uh, with anyone else in your household about do viruses, do microbes have rights? Should we care about the coronavirus? And would you ultimately uh, be uh, happy to be the person that pressed the button on making the coronavirus completely extinct if the last virus was alive on the earth. Have a think about that. Thank you again for joining me in the Life in the Universe pandemic series. Bye.